it's good to be with you today. <clears throat> this pollen got my throat in a little bit of a chokehold. Anybody else been beat up by pollen this week? Listen, I think if we band together, if we band together and jump him, we might win. <laughs> Mucinex ain't got nothing for this Atlanta pollen. It's that, that, uh, that south side Atlanta pollen choking people out. Listen, a couple of things before we jump into the word now. Uh, I want to remind you, as you know, uh, Holy Week kicks off today. And uh, first, I want to ask your forgiveness, and, and I sincerely mean this. Um, coming out of the 21 days of prayer and fasting, I, I didn't want to put too much on you. Um, but I really want us to be a church that acknowledges the season of Lent and acknowledges what Holy Week means and, and acknowledges each year for those of us who are followers of the way of Jesus, um, that this is a significant holiday. That's where the word holiday comes from. This is a significant holy day. It's a holy season. And so I, I commit to you next year, I'm going to lead you better into this season. We will lead you better into this season. I've got a few things planned, including a 40-day Lent devotional, so pray for a miraculous time for me to write that. Um, but I'm excited about this week. We're going to be doing services every day. Uh, I know everybody can't be at every service, but again, this is a commitment we wanted to make. And so uh, we're going to be doing uh, Holy Week. There's our schedule. Uh, today for Palm Sunday, tomorrow we're going to do Holy Monday at noon and Tuesday at noon. Uh, first Wednesday will be Holy Wednesday. We're gonna, it's the sermon I've been waiting to preach for two years. The only thing Jesus was wearing on the cross was the anointing oil that that poor woman poured on him on Wednesday evening. All right, I can't wait to preach that. Uh, Thursday, Monday, Thursday at noon. Uh, if you grew up in that tradition, we're not washing feet. Um, I wanted to, but I was vetoed. Uh, so <laughs> save them, Lord. Uh, and, then, and then Good Friday, I'm excited. We're going to do a seven last words service for Good Friday, the seven last words of Jesus. Black Saturday, of course, is silent Saturday. It's the day that everything went quiet. And then Sunday morning, we're going to celebrate him coming up out of that tomb in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you notice the service times changing uh, starting on Easter to 9 and 11. I've been saying that every week for about eight weeks now. Uh, so please don't show up at 10. Please don't show up. Actually, please don't show up at 1020. Uh, please don't show up. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm shady. Please don't show up at 1207. Okay. Uh, 9 and 11. For those of you online, we'd love to see you in the house for Easter Sunday, 9 and 11. And uh, we are believing that the Lord is going to meet us mightily. Uh, last year, we, we filled up both of these rooms. So show up early and expect it and get you a seat. Or uh, you might be in the lobby watching them TVs out there. So show up early and expect it. Be in here uh, ready to receive from the Lord. Uh, before we jump in any further, check out this video that I want to set up our time. What did we just watch, you're wondering? It's probably unfamiliar to you unless you've traveled the world pretty extensively or, or maybe you have some cross-cultural connections. Um, but that is a song well known to every single person 
in Taiwan. Every single Thai person knows that song. It is culturally iconic, so much so that it is actually played before movie showings and public gatherings and all sorts of events where the people gather together. Uh, it is called the Royal Anthem, and it's also played throughout the day in the streets of Bangkok. And when the anthem begins, it is required that all stand and all observe silence uh, while it is played. And wherever they are, and no matter what they are doing, no matter what they are doing, okay, people come to a standstill and they observe the king during this song. You see where I'm going today? It is seen as a display of love for their king. It shows a reverence for their king. And the words themselves, as we've just heard and read, display a longing, listen, a longing, a dependence, a security, a hope in their king. You may have a myriad of thoughts and emotions related to hearing that anthem and how it is viewed in Thai culture, but there is at least one thing that we can agree on having seen that. There is at least one thing we can agree on having seen that, and what is revealed in this video is that despite our rebellious nature, despite the rebellious nature of human beings, we want a leader that we can revere. Despite our rebellious nature, and especially here in the West, and I'll touch on that in a moment, despite how we view the world, despite some of the things that we circumnavigate inside of ourselves, despite all of those things, deep down, we want someone we can trust to show us the way to go. Our myths, our mythologies, our militaries, our private and public organizations all speak to a shared human desire across cultures and across time. Somewhere beneath even the weird, 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 weird fascination some U.S. citizens have with the royal family in England. <laughs> it's weird, man. Even underneath that weird fascination is this thing. This desire to be a part of something that is grand and glorious and to have a leader lead us to the proper way. People want the safety and security of an admirable leader. That's reality. But there's a challenge, right? There's a challenge to that desire that you and I face every day, especially here in the U.S., and it is twofold. Here in the U.S., the, the first part of that challenge is our nation was founded on what? Breaking away from a king. And so because our nation is founded on breaking away from a king, we tend to have an individualism that runs so deeply that it wages war against this ingrained desire. We also have been subject, frankly, to so many failures in leadership that it leaves us simultaneously conflicted by our desires to have a leader we can admire and our distrust of the human beings who have either been elected or selected or hired to be our leaders. And how does that leave us feeling? Well, if I could capture it in a few words, I feel like it leaves us generally distrusting of authority figures. I feel like it leaves us generally self-protective, right? Right? Generally in a posture and a position where we feel, you know what, even though deep down I might want a leader, I'm going to have to figure this out on my own. Nobody else is going to show me the way. And so we do life on our own terms, the way that we're going to do it, believing that that is the way that we're going to get it done. Have I said anything untrue? All right. Now here's the reality. I stand right there with you. I do. <laughs> I do. The idea of absolute submission toward reverence for celebration of and love, love for a leader is as challenging to me as the language in that song. Did y'all read those words? Did you read the words? If you didn't, go back and listen to it later. That's a deep challenge for me. In fact, years ago, <laughs> years ago, uh, I led a small mutiny on my wrestling team at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, coach, if you're watching this, I'm sorry. Again, I love you. Um, but we had some tension building. 
We had some tension building. I won't go into the details of that tension, but we had some tension building. And so a few of us athletes got together, including Nate Parker, who is now an uh, actor and director you may well know of. We got together and we decided that we weren't going to do what Coach wanted us to do anymore. And so we staged the rebellion. And we tried to lead others in staging that rebellion. And we tried to lead others into resisting his leadership. Now, the reality is this full-scale revolt against practices and against running and against stadium steps and against everything else didn't really pan out the way we thought it would. You see, we had demands, right? We had demands. We wanted our rights. What we forgot is we had parents. One call, that's all. He called Janice Crump, and, uh, well, let's just say your boy was back in line. Two sweets. <laughs> and that rebellion didn't last very long. Now, I share that with you only because I live in the same tension that you do. And if I could, if I could, I would guide you out of it. You see, again, we are raised so individualistically in the West that a wholehearted following of leadership is just an incredible challenge. It is a challenge to our ability to fully follow any human being. But here's the reality. It is also a challenge to you and I fully following Jesus. This is the hurt. In case you wondered, this is the thing. For those of us who say we follow the way of Jesus and we're like, why do I keep wanting to do things my own way, in my own time, with my time, with my money, with my people, with myself, with my, why am I, because this is it. We have a hurdle we must overcome in understanding that there is a simultaneously conflicting desire inside of us to have a leader we can trust, but to also do life on our own terms. And this is the fight. This is the fight we fight. This is the fight we fight. Even those of us who say and, and would be called followers of the way of Jesus. Listen, we love Jesus as Savior, but we struggle with him as king. We love him as Savior, but as leader, as, as Lord over my life, whoo. Submitting every, submitting every arena of my life to his leadership. No parts kept back. No parts kept covered. No parts pulled in. Everything, whew, that's a tall order. That's a tall order. In fact, listen, I told you guys I will always be honest so that you can also feel free to be honest. You know, I was crazy enough to pray prayers like, Lord, if you didn't want me to do it, why would you make me so competent? <laughs> right? That's my confession for today. These are my confessions, right? That's, that's my confession for today. I actually prayed that prayer, and he actually answered. He sent me to the book of Job. And I was like, okay. If that's how you want to play it, I don't think that's fair, you know, because you God and stuff. But, but here's the reality. We often do not live as though we have a king. We don't live as though we have a king. And yet scripture is clear that we do. And his name is Jesus. Love, dependence, reverence, celebration, submission. Here's the question I will put before you. Do those things characterize how you interact with Jesus? Can I read them again? Love, dependence, dependence. Where all my independent people at? Look, you, you've learned. Oh, sorry, you must be new. Never raise your hand when I say raise your hand. <laughs> Never walk into that. The rest of them are like, mm -mm, not me, not today. <laughs> you got to look for context clues. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Listen, me and you, we stand together. The rest of them, you know, God save them. <laughs> Dependence. Celebration. You know that's what we do here every Sunday. Celebration. Okay? I don't lift my hands because Dr. Crowley tells me to, although he is intimidating. I lift my hands because that is an ancient expression of submission and celebration. 
I don't sing because I'm told to sing. I sing because I want to celebrate the value and the worth and the worthiness of my king. But the reality is, family, we, we often don't act as though we have a king. We don't. Sometimes, at least I'll, I'll speak for me. I'll speak for me. Can I speak for me? I won't speak for you because you're holier than me. I'll speak for me. Sometimes I treat Jesus as an elected official who is unfollowable when he does not do the job as I've deemed it appropriate. <laughs> You've never done that, though, because you're full of the Spirit of God. And so what happens? What happens in that scenario? Our displays of affection are minimal, right? Because when you're overwhelmed with somebody, you can't help but be affectionate toward them. But if we're not overwhelmed by Jesus, our, our displays of affection, they are minimal. They are minimal. Our celebration of his kingship, it is diminished. It is diminished. Our reverence for him, reductionistic. His royalty, his royalty, a topic to be examined. Listen, a topic to be examined, but not a pervasive reality that requires our whole being. And yet the scriptures are clear, right? The scriptures are clear that before Kanye, Jesus is king. He didn't decide it at his album release party. Jesus is king, good, benevolent, and worthy of honor and celebration. And Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem in many ways. Much like the Thai anthem shows that when you, listen, when you believe that you have a king. Let me come over here because y'all quiet today. When you believe you have a king, you behave like you have a king. When you believe, when you, believe you have a king, you behave like you have a king. In fact, Mark describes the events of Jesus' triumphal entry this way. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied a colt that has never been written. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say to them, The Lord needs it. And <laughs> we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near the door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing? And they told them what Jesus had said. And the people allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. And then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting. So, again... When I say after a worship set, give God, you know when you say God with a W, it's holy. Give God a shout of praise. We are not just going through Christian ritual. We are participating in ancient spiritual practices. And so they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heavens. And then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, I can't wait to preach on this this week too. As he went in there and turned that thing out. When he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Let's get into it. Mark. The action writer that he is tells us nothing of Jesus' previous visit to Jerusalem, though it is quite apparent from their response and their reaction that Jesus had been there before. And you can go back and read for yourself. He even taught in the temple there before. And this makes sense of his arrival. And in fact, it makes this moment of his arrival all the more dramatic. 
You see, this was the week that Jesus would die. His imminent death was upon him, what we have come to know as Holy Week. And in fact, Jesus had just told his followers for the third time that he was going to die for the third time. So we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be handed over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death. Then they will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit upon him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again, and these jokers were still asking about our earthly kingdom. But that was days away. For now, Jesus still had the favor and the fandom of the people. You know, being a follower and a fan are two different things. He still had the favor and the fandom of the people. And why would he not? He walked all throughout Jerusalem and Judea, healing people and feeding. We, of course he's popular. Raising people from the dead, of course he's popular. He truly made multifaceted provision for people. In fact, just before he entered Bethany, listen, when they were approaching Bethany, just before he healed a man of blindness who pleaded for mercy. And so Mark tells us that when Jesus and his disciples were about half a mile from the city, he had them stop at the Mount of Olives. This was no coincidence. From the Mount of Olives, Jesus could survey all of Jerusalem, survey, listen, survey his kingdom, what belonged to him. Jesus gives detailed instructions. We already read those together, which clearly rests on supernatural knowledge. I don't know if you caught that, but Jesus tells them, go and get the donkey. Go ahead and get the donkey. And then when they ask you why you are getting the donkey, tell them that the master needs it. So he already knew that they were going to ask, and he already told the disciples how to respond. And if they were willing to respond appropriately, then nothing untoward would happen to them. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that the disciples did not balk at all? Did you catch that? I can't say that I'm that, I'm that saved. Again, I'm going to always be honest so you can be honest. The disciples didn't even ask any questions, right? How much time do we waste asking Jesus questions about things he's made clear? Well, what color is the donkey? What well, does the donkey bite? Is it male or female? Is it tall or short? These are the things that runs through my mind as I read it. I'm like, these are questions I would ask Jesus, and he probably would have just rolled his eye. Like, did I tell you to go? Did you, listen, for whoever this is for today, did I tell you to go? Then just go. Just go. The disciples didn't balk at all. They responded appropriately. And here's the lesson for us. Do what Jesus asked without worry or resistance because he's trustworthy. So if he asked, then it must be right. But you only believe that if you believe you have a king. You only believe that if you believe you have a king. Now, Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. This was a revolutionary move. He was declaring his kingship right then and there. And you say, how exactly? We're going to get to that in a moment. But let's finish narrating the story. So events unfold as Jesus said they would. We read that together already. They unfold just as Jesus said they would. The disciples show up. They find a little colt sitting outside. They, they start to untie it. It was somebody else's property. They came out and said, what are you doing there? And they said, well, the master has need of it. And the person was like, oh, okay. You can take it. You can go ahead and go. Why? Why? Because when we trust Jesus' words, things work out just as Jesus says. When we trust Jesus' words, or as some might say, Jesus is. I don't like that. That's poor English. When we trust Jesus' words, what? Things work out as Jesus says they will. So they return to Jesus. They've got the young donkey with them, and they take their cloaks, and they spread it across the back of the donkey, and, and what you or I reading that might think, well, they just don't want him to get dirty, right? Am I the only one? You can walk into this one. Nobody's in trouble. But <laughs> I'm like, they, they don't want him to get dirty. It's Jesus. He got his, you know, he's got his seamless robe on, right? They don't want that to get dirty. It's white season. You know, let's, let's, let's make sure Jesus is all right. No, no, they're doing more than that. 
what they're doing in that moment is constructing an impromptu throne. They're they're constructing a, a, a royal seat for Jesus. In fact, consider this, and maybe you did already, because again, I, I believe you to be incredibly bright people. Jesus has walked everywhere else he's ever gone. Did you think about that? Jesus walked everywhere. Birkenstocks in tow. Right? Jerusalem cruisers. He walked everywhere. How do we know he walked everywhere? Well, because it says he walked everywhere. And in several encounters, in several encounters, in fact, the encounter that they have, we're going to talk about this on Wednesday, when the, when the woman comes and pours it all on his feet, he turns to the guy there who's looking in disgust like, ooh, that's nasty. And he says, when I came in, you didn't offer me any water to wash my feet. And yet she has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. That is what devotion looks like. So he walked everywhere. Why is he not walking now? Don't miss this. His decision to ride the rest of the journey into Jerusalem was another claim to his authority. It was the fulfillment of the words that the prophet had spoken hundreds of years before. Jesus rejoiced greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. When Jesus jumped on that donkey, he knew exactly what he was doing. Your king is here. I have arrived. The peace that I promised, I'm about to secure. If you see me for what I am, then you will walk in the fruit of the work that I am doing. He knew exactly what he was doing. He knew it. He knew it. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was not routine. It was the culmination of the revolution that he began the moment that he opened his mouth and turned water into wine. Bless God. It was not grape juice. It was wine. I imagine a nice Malbec. He was no mere miracle working man. He was not another prophet in the long line of the prophets who spoke the word of God on behalf of God. No, in that moment, he said, I am God. I am God. And not only am I God, I am king. And his entrance into Jerusalem on the back of this young donkey was an announcement to every earthly ruler and every other worldly power that your power has been evacuated, that your authority has been put in check, that your boundaries has been established, that the king of the universe stands in your presence. That's what Jesus is announcing. And the people, well, the people seem to have a sense of it, right? They took off their cloaks and they spread them on the road and they, and they spread out palm branches, which is where we get the idea of Palm Sunday. And this practice, you can go back and do the research yourself, this is what they did in the inauguration of a new king. As Jesus approaches, the people shout, Hosanna. Hosanna. Do you know what Hosanna means? You know what it means? It means save us now, we pray. Save us now, we pray. Save us. For generations, the people had longed for the return of the glory days of Israel. Under the the leadership of their great and ancient king, David, when Israel was powerful and prosperous. But generations of sin and generations of wickedness and generations of sinful and wicked leadership had shattered and scattered and subjugated to the rule, Israel, of varying foreign powers. Most recently in this moment during Jesus' incarnation to Rome. And the people longed for the one who would deal with the enemies of the nation and rule as king of the world. They expected the new David 
to be a human figure. And that through this human being, God would actually come to rule the nation. I know it's a lot of text today, but I want you to know where I'm coming from. For I am a great king, says Yahweh, of hosts. And my name is reverenced among the nations, Malachi 1.14. I will extol you, my God and my king, and bless your name forever. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The biblical authors expected Yahweh to become king through a son of David who would enter the holy city. Could anybody be missing that day what was actually taking place? Not if they read their Bibles. Jesus was not only, listen, and this is why I included verse 11. You're like, that, that don't even fit the theme. Yes, it does. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Because Yahweh promised that his glory would return to the temple. And in Jesus, his glory returned to the temple. In Jesus, the son of David reascended to his throne. Listen, in Jesus, Yahweh himself had come to lead the nation. But there was a misunderstanding. There was a misunderstanding by those who witnessed Jesus coming. Perhaps the same misunderstanding that we have now, some of us. You see, they cried out Hosanna to Jesus. They cried it out to Jesus. But it wasn't an appeal to save their souls. It was an appeal to save them from foreign powers. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. What they saw in Jesus was a powerful man who could sway people and heal the sick and command crowds. It is no wonder, somebody, listen, it is no wonder that they thought that he would save them from their situation. Because that's what he did. And that's how they saw him. They saw him as a, as a man able to do great things. They truly believed that Jesus was able to bring salvation. But here was their misunderstanding. They cried out for the right Savior, but for the wrong salvation. They cried out for the right Savior, but for the wrong salvation. Listen, they cried out for the right king, but for the wrong kingdom. They cried out for the right king, save us. They cried out for the right king, but for the wrong kingdom. They believed Jesus able, but limited his ableness to their limited understanding. I mean, who am I to judge? It is a... Uh, a reality that I would probably be right there. Like, I'm tired of these Romans, Lord, do something. I won't dig into that any further. We don't have time. Here's what I'll say, though. Their cry should be familiar to us. Right? Be king over my circumstances. Rather, rather, than king over my life, my choices, my worship, my fear, my control. Be king over my situation. Step in and be king over my situation until I got it. And then I'll take it from here. This is what they were experiencing. Essentially, their cry was, Jesus, be king the way we want you to be king. If only they understood the words that they had had for generations. That the government that God was calling forth and the peace that God was calling forth and the kingdom that God was calling forth and the justice that God was calling forth, that these things could not be captured or captivated in a human being, nor could they be temporal. They had to be eternal. But they missed it. They wanted a temporal kingdom, a comfortable kingdom, an immediate kingdom. And what Jesus promised them was a universal kingdom, a never-ending kingdom, an eternal kingdom, backed by the zeal of God himself. Before them was not king for a day, 
or king for a season or king for a moment or king of this circumstance. It was the king of the universe there to subvert hell, death, and the grave, not just Roman rule. It's a king who today rules over this universe. It was to he that they cried, save us now, we pray. Save us now, we pray. If only they knew, if only they knew who he truly was, perhaps they would not have been crying out days later, crucify him. If they knew who he truly was, perhaps they would not have been crying out days later, crucify him. The king declared the bringing of the kingdom. He declared to be coming in the name of the Lord, and yet he would be killed as a criminal less than a week after his arrival with king of the Jews stamped over his head. And yet what could be presumed as bad news is in fact good news. What could be presumed as bad news is in fact good news. Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem is determined, triumphant, listen, precisely because he was crucified. Only a crucified king could save completely. Jesus took all of the dysfunction of this world upon himself and he swallowed it up in an ocean of divine mercy and forgiveness. He dealt with the enemies of the nation not through power but through sacrifice and he emerged as the properly crowned king of the universe. Why is that important? Because earthly kingdoms rise and fall. Earthly governments come and go. One president is elected, and then the next president is elected and reverses everything that president did. And it happens again and again and again. The Roman Empire, at its peak, sprawled across more landmass than any known modern government. And when God said it was over, in a matter of years, it was just done. No, those things don't last. But the kingdom of God. Secured by the crucified kingdom, the crucified king Jesus is a kingdom that has no end. And those who believe in that king and, and who believe in that kingdom, they are invited into life eternal and life full of joy and peace and fullness. Now listen, if you're investigating a relationship with Jesus today, if you're deconstructing right now, if you're wondering what all of this Christian stuff is about, this is the heart of the matter. Not the things that we fight about, not the things on social media, not the people picketing outside because of different reasons that they believe that their zeal must be seen. This is the heart of the matter. Is Jesus king? Is he the one? Did he die for those who would otherwise spurn him? And is he resurrected? And is he all-powerful? And is he worthy of following? That's the heart of the matter. Everything else, everything else can be sorted in the wash. That's the heart of the matter. The reward, the joy, the joy in submitting to Jesus' love and leadership is that you have abundant life and eternal life and freedom. In fact, if we are stirred even just a little, the question is, what do we do now? What do we do now? This is going to be disgustingly simple and at the same time ridiculously complex because of who we are. Live like Jesus is king. That's what we do. We live like Jesus is king. We acknowledge Jesus as king over every area of our life. King over your decisions. King over your relationships. King over your job choices. King over how you spend time. King over how you spend money. King over where you show up. King over how you present yourself. King over everything. That's what we do. We share the good news of the gospel like Jesus is king. We gather weekly for worship like Jesus is king. We gather weekly for worship like Jesus is king. Like Jesus is king. We commit to serving like Jesus is king. That's why I'm wearing my rental kids t-shirt today. 
because I'm going to serve and rent no kids. And y'all going to watch me on the screen. Okay? Because if we all in, we all in. Jesus is king. Give like Jesus is king. Love like Jesus is king. Vote like Jesus is king. Stand firm like Jesus is king. And if that feels like a tall order, if that feels like a tall order today, then I'll just say this. Can you think of one area in your life, one area in your life where you know right now you are not submitted to Jesus as king? You know it. He know it. Your friends know it. Can you submit that to him today? If you submit to Jesus' kingship, the great gift that he extends to you is abundant life, eternal life, unfailing love, abundant mercy, overwhelming grace, overwhelming joy, joy that cannot be shaken or taken by anybody. That is his gift to us. In fact, I would say it this way, even though it's hard for us to maybe conceive this, there is more comfort and freedom under his leadership than out from under it. And the reality is, family, <laughs> the only alternative we have is to continue in trusting ourselves over Jesus. Jesus hoping in earthly leaders, hoping in earthly leaders who have proven time and time again to be insufficient, some downright incompetent, hoping that someone will come along and make it better. That is our only alternative, and they will always be unable to provide that for which we actually long. And so here's my question. What if, what if we begin today, right now, right now, to truly live as though we have a king, a king in our home, a king in our workplace, a king in our neighborhood, a king in our church, a king in our school, a king in our city. What if we began to live that way today? Like we actually have a king. Here's what I believe. I believe we'll fully understand those words that so many of us know how to pray, your kingdom come and your will be done. But more than that, I believe we'll actually see it. I believe we'll see it. I've been asking God, how, how does revival happen? How does revival happen? How do we see revival? I've been asking for weeks after Asbury, how do we see revival? And you know what he said? You know what he said? That when the hearts of my people are fully turned to me as king, then I will show up in ways that they cannot imagine. Here's our invitation today. And I hope you would say with me in your heart, long live the king. Father, we pray now in the name of Jesus that you would be magnified over all of this, that your glory would be present, clear, and tangible, and that we would be fully transformed having heard your word and that we would never be the same because of it. Father God, we pray that you would continue to do in this community what only you can do. And that we would experience the joy of your love and leadership together. In Jesus' name, amen.